Um, my name is Alan Rotenberg, and I'm asked to introduce today's keynote speaker for two reasons. First, I'm a former board chair, in fact, the first chair of the combined Beth Israel Medical Deaconess uh, Medical Center. And secondly, and maybe more importantly, I'm the proud father-in-law of today's keynote speaker, Bruce Feiler. Bruce is the New York Times best-selling author of eight books, including Walking the Bible, Where God Was Born, America's Prophet, Moses, and the American Story. He's an award-winning journalist and is the writer-presenter of the PBS miniseries on Walking the Bible. Uh, Bruce has traveled to over 60 countries and five continents, immersing himself in different cultures, which he brings vividly to life. His books include one of my favorites, Learning to Bow, which is an account of the year he spent teaching in a small Japanese town, looking for class about life inside of Oxford and Cambridge, and Under the Big Top, which depicts the year he spent performing as a clown in the Clyde Beatty Cole Brothers Circus. Bruce has written for numerous publications, including The New Yorker, The New York Times, and Gourmet, where he's won three James Beard Awards. He's been the subject of a Jay Leno joke and a Jeopardy question, and his clown face, believe it or not, appears on a postage stamp in the Grenadines. But nothing on his resume is more important to me than his being the loving and caring husband of my daughter, Linda, and the nurturing father of Eden and Tybee, our identical five-year-old twin granddaughters. Brooks' latest book, The Council of Dads, de details his courageous and so far successful bad battle with a rare form of cancer, which he transforms into an uplifting journey of friendship, family, brotherhood, and self-discovery. Bruce's idea of enlisting a team of six men from different stages of his life to weave into his own family's life is a testament to the values, bonds, and support family and friends can provide to one another. The Council of Dads is both personal and universal, inspiring and uplifting, and I urge you to read it. In the past four weeks since the Council of Dads was published, Bruce and the book have been featured in Time Magazine, USA Today, on the Today Show, this week's issue of People Magazine, and a special by Sanjay Gupta on CNN, which is ex um, scheduled to be expanded to a one-hour special to be shown on Father's Day weekend. So it's with an equal measure of pride and pleasure that I welcome my son-in-law to this celebration of life, Bruce Filer. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everybody. And um, what a wonderful afternoon. How nice of them to paint the sky blue uh, in honor of survival. And I think that what Alan didn't say, and his wife, my mother-in-law, is uh, sitting next to him, is that I'm actually far more comfortable under this tent because it reminds me of, a, of the circus tent that I spent a year performing under. And I, but I, have to, I dare say that my mother, where she here, she's, not, she's in Savannah, and my mother-in-law, are probably happier because this is as close as I'm ever going to get to Harvard Medical School. <laughs> but I am indeed very happy to be here um, for all the reasons that you know uh, to honor uh, Alan and his service to uh, Beth Israel and this great community uh, to celebrate this afternoon and to celebrate with you uh, the journey of survivorship that so many of us are on. Let me see because I know there are people have been brought here for many reasons. Who, here, who in our room here today is a survivor? Uh, look at that. Okay, well, congratulations. Can we give us all a round of applause? Um, so I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, and when I was four years old, my parents moved to a new neighborhood, and in this neighborhood, all of the streets were named after Confederate war generals. We lived on Robert E. Lee Boulevard. And when I was five, my parents gave me an orange, for my fifth birthday, my parents gave me an orange Schwinn Stingray bicycle. I'm sure many of you have, turned out that two-thirds of America had one of these bikes. It had a swooping banana seat and what they called ape hanger handlebars because the rider looked like an orangutan. Now what my mother probably didn't know at the time is that these handlebars were modeled after hot rod motorcycles in the 1960s. 
So one day I was exploring this neighborhood where we lived and I found this new cul-de-sac a few streets away that I hadn't known before. It turns out it was called Pickett Circle. And so as I was driving along, I, I wanted to get back to this cul-de-sac to explore it more quickly, to do some reconnaissance, and I very intentionally decided to pedal into this major thoroughfare that bisected our neighborhood when wham, I was hit by a passing sedan. My mangled bike flew in one direction, my mangled body in another. I lay on the warm pavement. A neighbor came running over and she looked over at me and she said, Andy, Andy, how are you doing? Using the name of my older brother. Yeah. I'm Bruce, I said, and promptly passed out. I broke my left femur that day, it's the largest bone in your body. And for the next two months, I was in a body cast that went from the tip of my chin down to my left toe, then down to my right knee, and a steel bar went from my right knee to my left ankle. For 38 years, that accident was the only medically interesting thing that ever happened to me. In fact, when I would go to the doctor, I'd race through those forms, very uh, sort of proud of myself for not having much to fill out. Until two years ago this week, a routine blood test showed that I had an elevated alkaline phosphatase number, which is a very nondescript and actually not very trusted test, which suggested something was wrong with my bones. And my doctor, on what seemed like a whim, suggested I get a full body bone scan, which produced evidence of some vague tumor in my left femur, which sent me to get an x-ray and then an MRI, and then led to a phone call from my doctor. The tumor in your leg is not consistent with a benign tumor. So suddenly I stopped walking and I actually had spent a, you know, uh, my entire life walking, traveling around the world, uh, entering different cultures, writing as you heard my father-in-law say, walking the Bible, hosting a show on PBS called Walking the Bible. Well suddenly I was the walking guy who might never walk again. And in fact, on this day, when I got this call, it took my mind a second to convert that double negative into a single, much more horrifying negative. I have cancer. And it seemed like too much of a coincidence that the tumor was in the same place, in the same bone, in the same place in my body. So that afternoon, I went home. And as you heard Alan say, I uh, am the father of the time of identical twin daughters who were three years old. Their names are Eden for the Garden of Eden and Tybee, which is this beach off the coast of Georgia where I grew up. And on this afternoon, they came running in to greet me. They were very much girly girls at the time, still are. Uh, they were interested in all manner of princesses, cupcakes, and tutus. We called them Pinkalicious and Purplicious. Uh, though I have to say our favorite nickname for them came on their birthday when they were born at 614 and 646 p.m. on April 15th, 2005, our otherwise grim, humorless doctor, maybe I shouldn't insult doctors in this room, but anyway, our otherwise grim, humorless doctor looked at his watch and was like, hmm, April 15th, tax day, early filer and late filer. Uh, <laughs> uh, the next day, in fact, the doctor came in to check. I mean, he had said nothing friendly all year. I mean, you know, I, he was the least, until I met oncologists, he was like the least friendly doctor I'd ever seen. Um, <laughs> You, th you, think I'd, you think oncologists are grim. Uh, it's great, you know, it's great to be in a cancer room. You can make cancer jokes. Okay, anyway, so um, he came the next morning. He's like, um, I was like, doctor, that was a really great line. I've gotten a lot of mileage out of it. He's like, you're the writer, kid. Uh, so on this day, Eden and Tybee, they, they kind of ran in. They, they were doing this dance they had just made up where they turned faster and faster until they tumbled to the ground, laughing with all the glee in the world. I crumbled. I kept imagining all the walks I might not take with them the boyfriends I might not scowl at, the aisles I might not walk down. Would they wonder who I was, I thought? Would they yearn for my approval, my love, my voice? A few days later, while visiting my in-laws on Cape Cod, I woke up with an idea of how I might give them that voice. I would reach out to six men from all parts of my life and ask them to be present through the passages of my daughter's lives. My daughters will have plenty of opportunities in their lives, I wrote to these men. They'll have loving families, they'll have welcoming homes, they'll have each other.